All right, John chapter 3 tonight. Verse 22 says this, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. It's important for water baptism. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Father, we love you. God, so thankful tonight for your word and just uh, speak to our hearts, God. I know you've got a word for us tonight. I pray, God, that as you bring it through the power of your Holy Spirit, that our hearts would be open and receptive and hungry. That, God, your word would not be met with resistance. uh, That your word would not be met with objection. That your word would not be met with doubt tonight. But that, Father, knowing how deeply you love us, and that every word in your word is good, even and sometimes especially those ones that hurt. I pray, God, that you'd give us an open heart because you know that our desire is to just be disciples of Jesus. And God, we've got so far to grow in that. So grow us tonight. Give us something to apply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. I just want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. And um, I would encourage you guys, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student of American history. I love American history. I really encourage you guys to just research the, the history of Thanksgiving. And, and obviously, you know, that it's kind of morphed away from its original intention. It's kind of become, in some ways, a very secular holiday for us. Uh, but originally, it was intended to be a day that the nation stopped everything and just gave thanks to God, you know, for his providential care and his sovereignty Um, over this country Um, and, you know, over the affairs of the country. And different presidents have reiterated it over the years, oftentimes after, you know, great calamity that God had faithfully brought us through. Uh, But I want to wish you guys a happy Thanksgiving, and I really want to encourage you to remember the real meaning of of Thanksgiving. And, you know, it may be tonight that you're like, Pastor, what is there to be thankful for? I mean, it is insane. Have you read the news lately? You go online and Ferguson is on fire. There's, you know, one after another issue with our government. Mistrust in our government has never been higher. The Middle East is a tinderbox. It's like a a fire waiting to happen. There's still economic instability. People are living, you know, certainly not at the standard that they used to be living at. And so all of those things, you know, that's on a macro scale, and then you kind of boil it down to some of the micro issues that we deal with ourselves in our own lives. And, and, you know, when you think of giving thanks, maybe you kind of survey all of that, and, you know, the first thing in your heart is not a response of uh, gratitude or thanksgiving. I want to give you a reason to be thankful tonight, just a couple. Uh, number one is this, God is on his throne, all right? Number one, no matter what's going on, Racial unrest, civil unrest, racial division, Ferguson on fire. Um, Although we should be praying for those things, please never forget that God, our God, is on his throne. In other words, God is in control. And as everybody freaks out, we do not have to freak out. The second thing I want to encourage you with is this, that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are loved by God, forgiven of your sins, and have been bound, all right? That's, That's like three in one, so that's, you know... Three in one blessing, you're loved by God, forgiven of your sins, and you're heaven bound. And so I want to give you guys a little homework. I know that some of you are on vacation from school right now, and you're like, I did not come here for homework. But this is your homework. I want you to spend some time tomorrow, spend some time counting your blessings. Spend at least 15 minutes. Get a a piece of paper and a pencil, get your iPad, your iPhone, your Android, whatever you use, and like get it down. Put it on your technology, write it down on paper, write down those things that God has blessed you with, and then take that and share that with other people because God has been so good to us. And then remember with me that for all of the issues that are happening in life, Jesus is the answer. And you know, I... Honestly, I look at the time of uh, year that we're in right now, and with everything that's going on, this is a message that we have. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. This, this is our message. For as much unrest and division and calamity that there is in this world, we bring this glorious message, the solution. His name is Jesus Christ, 
and he is the Prince of Peace. And so, you know, bear that boldly uh, this Christmas season. So we're picking up the story. We're kind of transitioning now. Last week, of course, Jesus was having this very deep conversation with one of the great religious leaders in Israel. His name was what? And so that conversation ended. By the way, if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you just to download the message so you can keep all of this in context because you really remember doing an in-depth study of the gospel according to John. We pick up the story. Jesus uh, is still in uh, Judea. He's now outside of the city of Jerusalem. And there are two ministries that are happening concurrently here as uh, John mentions this. John the Baptist, we're going to talk about John the Baptist, not to be confused with John the Apostle, the author of this gospel account. John the Baptist is still um, involved in his ministry. Remember, he had a ministry of repentance, and he was directing people to the Messiah uh, who was revealed to him by God at those baptismal waters. And so... John is still with his disciples, water baptizing. Jesus is now also baptizing uh, in the Jordan River with his disciples. Now, most commentators believe that Jesus wasn't really the one doing the actual baptism. It's never really framed that way as you look at the different gospel accounts. He was certainly overseeing uh, the water baptism. But remember with me, John's ministry at this point is kind of waning because Jesus was the fulfillment of, of John's message. But at this point, John had not been thrown into prison. I, I, you know, I have to say, I love the Bible, and I love the characters of the Bible because I identify with them. You know, how many leaders that you look up to um, are leaders that have been thrown into prison? You know, I just, and I've been thrown into jail. I don't know, maybe it's just a personal connection that I have with John, (laughs) but but, uh, I'm like, Christianity is so cool. Not that getting thrown into prison is cool. Don't get me wrong here tonight. You're like, pastor said, okay, first thing I can do. I just, we're going to talk about why he was thrown into prison. I just, I love the testimony of scripture and how these guys lived their lives so faithfully for the Lord. But his ministry was waning. It was really coming to an end because Jesus was the fulfillment. He was the focus of John's message Remember, it was a baptism of repentance. He was exhorting people to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. Um, John was a man, John the Baptist was a man who preached the truth without fear. He preached it with total boldness. And he would be thrown into prison not for for violating violating a law, not for immorality, but remember, he had taken a stand concerning uh, Herod at the time who had stolen his half-brother's wife and made her his wife. And John was a man who stood you know, for the principles of God, and as he made this proclamation against what Herod had done, uh, Herod's new wife, Salome, got kind of upset about that, and so she had John, and we're gonna see this in a couple of weeks, she had John thrown into prison. She viewed what he said as he was just speaking the truth, boldly, um, and I'm not sure how it was presented, but he certainly was, was speaking the truth. She perceived it. She took it kind of like hate speech. You know, I want to tell you, you need to prepare yourself for this with the direction that our culture is going. As you and I faithfully stand on the word of God, more and more what we're going to see is that our message, the message of truth, is going to be framed as hate speech. I have friends who pastor in Canada And there literally are things, uh, some of them are on the radio, there literally are things they cannot say. For instance, um, they can, in the church, they can preach about morality. They can say that homosexuality, as we read the scriptures, clearly it's presented this way, homosexuality is a sin. They can say that in the pulpit, but they can't broadcast that message over the radio because in Canada, That's construed as hate speech, and if you do that over the airwaves, you as a pastor can actually get thrown into jail. Interesting. This is the direction, I'm warning you, this is the direction that our culture is going. So how do we respond to that? Well, I think that we kind of take John's approach. We don't back down. We communicate the truth. We communicate it in love, and we trust God with the consequences. And you know, that's something that we don't have to wait to do until the government begins to put 
the truth into the framework of hate speech, you guys are living that right now. You're living it out in the world. Some of you are working in the casinos. You operate businesses. You're out in the world, and you're, you're interfacing with people of the world and worldly systems and worldly structures. And you know as well as I do that there is pressure on you not to communicate or convey the truth of God's Word. In those moments when God is laying something on your heart and you know you have an opportunity, and look at that opportunity as you communicate the truth, it may cost you something. It may cost you upward mobility. It may cost you a connection that could lead to a business opportunity. It could literally cost you your job. But in those situations, what we do is we make a value decision. Do we value the gospel of Jesus Christ over, and, and you fill in the blank. And let me tell you something. Every time you take a step of faith and trust God and convey his message with love, regardless of what happens to you, God will always be faithful. So maybe tonight you're in that situation. I would just want to encourage you tonight to communicate and convey what God has placed on your heart because uh, let me tell you something. Someone's salvation is more important than your upward mobility. So here they were still, John was still going through um, the process of water baptizing people. Jesus and John and the disciples, both of those groups, really were communicating the same message. And this was the message, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is near. They were conveying the same message. This was what water baptism represented. It, it was an outward sign that represented an inward reality. This was the inward reality. A person had come to a place where they, they were purifying themselves um, of sin for God. They were purifying themselves. They were repenting of sin so that they could draw nearer to God. And water baptism represented the purification of the heart uh, to God. And in a physical sense, it was the physical body being dipped down into those baptismal waters. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, baptism kind of originated with Christianity. Baptism did not originate with Christianity. Uh, the, the mikvah ritual bath was something that every Jew participated in. If you were going to temple and you were going to offer a sacrifice, before you would go up to the temple mount, you would go into a ritual mikvah bath that had flowing water. It wasn't just a standing body of water. Uh, there were a lot of rabbinical um, conditions for something to be considered a, a mikvah bath. But you would go down into this uh, running pool of water, at least 200 gallons. You would completely strip yourself of all clothing, and you would dip yourself uh, completely, you know, all the way down into the water. And then you would walk back up, and you would put on new garments and then you would go present your offering in the temple. And so this represented this, this tradition in Israel, this Jewish tradition represented a heart that was being purified uh, from sin and turning to God to serve him. And, and so John the Baptist, as he was led by God, he picked this tradition up and he conveyed this message. It was a baptism of repentance, prepare your heart for the coming of the Messiah. Now, he was out in the Jordan River. He was water baptizing. Um, obviously needed to be at a place where there was a lot of water because it wasn't just sprinkling. And I know a lot of people have different um, perspectives when it comes to water baptism and which tradition is uh, the accurate tradition. If we're to look at it from a bib biblical perspective, it was always full immersion water baptism. So you had to be at a place where there was a lot of water. This is where John is at. This is where the disciples of Jesus are at as well. We actually sometimes go to this place, um, and there are some people, there's, there's a, a site that's been built there. You can actually do water baptisms that are there. Um, there are uh, guards, Israeli guards on one side, IDF uh, soldiers, because the water there, the Jordan River, on the one side you have Israel, on the other side you have Jordan, um, and so the Israeli guards are guarding so that people don't come over the waters from, from Jordan. But the water is so polluted. It's so polluted uh, by 
um, contaminants from agriculture and things like that. I mean, it's gnarly. You can't even see to the bottom. It's just nasty water. So we never do our water baptisms there. Don't be afraid. Um, I was baptized there once. Before I was baptized, I had hair. Then when I came out, all my hair was gone. That's not, that's not what happened. Verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. So now there's a dispute, all right? And there are Jews that come to John's disciples. Now, I mentioned this last week when the gospel of John uses the word Jews, it is typically referring to those Jews who are in positions of religious leadership. So that would include the Sadducees, the Pharisees, Um, it would include uh, the Sanhedrin, it would include the scribes, it typically represented those people who had positioned themselves against Jesus. And so think about this, it's not just talking about the general body of Jewish people, it's talking about a group, a very particular group that had positioned themselves against Christ and his message. And so these Jews, these religious leaders, this is what they're recognizing. You've got to catch the context here. They're looking at two groups of people that are becoming very successful. They're looking at John and his disciples, and they're looking at Jesus and his disciples, and all of these people are flocking All of these people are flocking to both of these men and their disciples, and as uh, religious leadership, they were very concerned about the hearts of the people being swayed by John and by Jesus. And so what these Jews, what these religious leaders do is they attempt to bring division between John the Baptist and his disciples and Jesus and his disciples. And so they, they, they use, first of all, they use theological argument. They begin to argue with John's disciples about purification and the tradition of purification. You know, we don't have a lot of detail on what the argument was about, but I would imagine they were arguing that John and his disciples did not have the religious authority to be overseeing um, this religious tradition because there was a person that had been dedicated to the mikvah bath that was appointed by the religious leadership. So probably the argument was something like this. Who do you guys think you are? You don't have the religious authority to be overseeing this type of tradition. They probably were arguing about the place that it was happening. There were places that had been set aside. The rabbis would go. They would oversee these particular places, make sure these places fulfilled all the criteria for a traditional mikvah bath, and they would give the religious stamp of approval. And so here John and his disciples and Jesus and his disciples, um, even though the water is flowing, which would have fulfilled the criteria, it still had not received the imprimatur of the religious leadership. But then not only that, um, they probably were arguing with John and his disciples about what the baptism actually meant. Um, As John was kind of presenting this position that it was preparing people for the Messiah, the religious Jews really had more of the perspective of it was preparing people to keep the traditions of the rabbis. And so the first thing they do is this, they try to bring division, they try to undermine this ministry with theological argument. The second thing is this, they try to instigate division between John and his disciples and Jesus and his disciples. Now, uh, when you read in verse 26, uh, it says this, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified, behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. Um, It is really difficult to know whether that's John's disciples saying that to him or whether it's these religious leaders called Jews that were saying this to him. It's possible if it's John's disciples, certainly we know that these religious leaders had been kind of using this message to stir up controversy or division between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. So if it's John's disciples, I don't mean to complicate this, they're just, they're just saying a message that's just been told to them. So these religious Jews go to the disciples, something like this, and they say, man, what's happened to you guys? Where's your ministry? You guys are decreasing. You guys are shrinking. And check this out. Jesus and his disciples, that ministry is growing. And so it's possible that the disciples were like, hey, wait a minute. 
what about us? What about our ministry? And so they go back to their leader, John the Baptist, and they say, teacher, the one you identified, check this out, everyone's going to him now. What's happening? Or it's possible that this is the religious leader saying it, and so they're using flattery. Rabbi, they say to John the Baptist, which by the way, uh, you know, they really didn't believe it in their hearts, so it's possible that, you know, they're just using flattery to kind of get to him so that he's more susceptible to this thing that they're going to levy on him. Rabbi, you know, you used to have all of this authority and power, but now look, Jesus and his disciples, everyone's going to them. And so John's got an opportunity to respond here. And listen, there's nothing easier, and I think that you guys will agree with this, there's nothing easier to get at the heart of a man than pride. There's nothing easier to get at the heart of a man than pride. And this is really what they're seeking to do. They're looking at uh, trying to bring division between these two groups because really they want the authority and the favor of the people. So they're protecting something. And so now John's in this place where he could so easily have said, hey, wait a minute. You know what? You're right. I sacrifice for God. I've laid all my life down for God. I've done all these things for God. I had this ministry. You know, Jesus, he didn't even acknowledge me. He didn't even affirm me. He didn't even really spend any time acknowledging my commitment and my sacrifice. He just kind of went on, and now all these people are going to him. John could have very easily taken that path and said, hey, what about me? God, what about me in all of this? And he could have had a heart that was stirred up with pride, but I want you to notice what he says. He says in verse 27, John answered, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So look, this is what John does, and this is what I respect so much about this man. As he has all of this input coming in, maybe from his disciples, maybe from the Jewish uh, leaders, you know, he's not sucked into it, he's not swayed by the flattery, and you know, his heart is not positioned so that he's concerned about competition. You know, it's almost as if this man was living in a place where he was, in a sense, above that. And, you know, I think that we're susceptible to these things, especially when we feel like we're not getting the attention that we deserve, especially when we feel like we're not getting the pats on the back that we might deserve, you know, or especially when God seems to be blessing somebody else. Have you ever been in this place before? You're serving God, you're pouring it out, you're doing everything that you can, and somebody else is, is doing something for God as well, certainly not as good as you're doing it. And you know, God does something. God begins to really, from your perspective, bless their ministry while it seems like he's not blessing yours at all. And you're like, what's up with this? Or you know, you got a family situation. You are loving your wife, man. You are like the killer husband, the most amazing husband ever on the face of the earth. You lay it, raise your hands, guys, if that's you tonight. Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> Two hands up here. I'm digging that. We're going to have you guys write a book together, okay, on, on how to be a husband. You're doing it right, and then you've got Joe Schmo over here who's not doing it right, and it seems almost as if his life and his marriage and his job is blessed, and you're thinking, what's up with this, God? I poured my heart out like this, and this is what I get. And you know how the devil he loves to take those, he plants those thoughts sometimes, but listen, those thoughts sometimes just find their root in the wickedness of our own heart. And he loves to take that, and man, he loves to fuel that flame. How do we ensure that we don't get sucked into that? Because let me tell you something, that is a vortex. That's just not a circle, that is a vortex, and it will suck literally the life right out of you. Number one, if we're going to guard our hearts against being susceptible to that type of pride, number one, we have to have a heart of humility. This is what John basically says. We have nothing and are nothing apart from God. We have nothing and are nothing apart from God. John was humble enough to know that nothing that God did through him was because of him at all. John was humble enough to know 
that everything that God did through him and that God gave him and all that he was was not because of him, it was 100% because of God. And this is simply what he says. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. So look, at it's, his hands are off of his ministry. It's not even his ministry. He wouldn't even have called it his ministry. Basically, he knew it was God's ministry, and he looks at these guys and says, this isn't mine, this belongs to God. And since it belongs to God, God can do whatever he wants with it. It belongs to him. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus would call John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, he would call him the greatest prophet who ever lived. I mean, that's a heavy handle. Think about Isaiah and Daniel and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Jonah and Amos and Malachi. Uh, David was called a prophet. You think of these great men, you know, as you go through the list, and this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, John is the greatest of all of the prophets. You know, if John was going to write a bio today, if John had the opportunity, John the Baptist was here, he was hanging with us, just got out of prison, we're chilling together, he's at Blessed Fest, and someone says, you know, dude, you should write a book. You should write a book. Um, and I tell you what, why don't we start with the bio? What do you think John the Baptist's bio would look like? You know, you, you flip over Christian books today, and you read the bio of the author, and some authors, you know, you read through the bio and you think, why do I need Jesus if I've got this guy? Because he's pretty amazing. You know, if, if, if I were to say, hey, John, why don't you connect with one of the big publishing companies and they can write a good bio, I think it would come out something like this today. I don't think he'd approve of it, but I think it'd sound like this. John the Baptist, the highly acclaimed man of God, was according to the words of the Messiah, not just among the great prophets, he was the greatest prophet. An accomplished water baptizer, he has been known for 2,000 years for starting the greatest movement known to humanity. He truly has been instrumental in changing the world and transforming cultures. His timeless principles of leadership make him one of the greatest leaders in human history. I think, I think that if modern Christianity was going to write a bio for him, that's how it would sound. And you know, sometimes you read these bios, and they come across my desk all the time, you can conclude, man, if, if, if this man or this woman is so great, why do I even need Jesus? Christian leaders are presented like that today. I don't think John the Baptist would have ever stood for something like this. A Presbyterian pastor in Melbourne, Australia, was introducing Hudson Taylor, and he used all of these superlatives, especially the word great. And as he finished, Hudson Taylor, you guys know one of the greatest missionaries of all time, he stepped to the pulpit and he quietly said, dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. I love that. He gets up after this great introduction and he just, just simply says, dear servants, dear friends, excuse me, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. I love that, a heart of humility. You know, God has choos, chosen the weak and foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Why did God pick you? Because you're weak and you're foolish. And that may not make you feel good, it may not make me feel good, but it's the truth of God's word. He has chosen us, so listen, no flesh will glory in his presence. It's not our physical beauty, it's not our intelligence, it's not um, our capabilities. God has chosen us so that people look at our lives. This is why God has chosen me. So that people can look at my life and say, if God can do that through Derek, God can do that through anybody. If God can do that through him, then God can do that in my life. And, and with humility, we need to be conveying this message. God hasn't picked you because of your talents or your qualities. He has chosen the weak and the foolish things of the world so that the wise are confounded. And so that the body of Christ can say, you know what, when it's all said and done, it is God. Tomorrow, 2,000 people or so are gonna get blessed. This is blessed fest. It's one crazy party of blessing tomorrow. 2,000 people, buses and shuttles and vans and dentists and doctors and hairstylists and makeover artists, makeup artists, whatever you call those people, people doing manicures, 
all kinds of crazy stuff, lawyers and, um, you know, social services people, all of us will be serving as hosts and hostess, hostesses. You know, you could easily step back and say, man, check this out. Calvary Chapel Spring Valley really has it together. These people are so organized. Who is the brain trust behind this? His name is Jesus. All right, let me tell you what happens every single week. We're like, we don't have this. We don't have this. I don't know how this is going to happen. What about this? I have no idea. And so it's one prayer request after another, and this is how it works. It is miracle after miracle after miracle. And so after something like this, we don't walk away exalting man. We walk away exalting God because God is the one from beginning to end who is actually doing it. Let me ask you something. Is that your life? Is that your life? If you were to evaluate your life, if others were to evaluate your life, do they see a a string of miracles that God is getting the glory for? God moving through your life in such a way that others can say, man, if God can do that in his life or her life, God can do it in mine. The second thing I want you to notice is this. He never claimed to be something that he wasn't. Uh, He says this in verse 28. He says, you guys know, this is my paraphrase, you all know I said that I was not the Christ, but I've been sent by him. So John never claimed to be something that he wasn't. This is what he did. He started his ministry with, I'm not the Messiah, and he is going to end his ministry with, I'm not the Messiah. In other words, John is saying, don't look at me, don't point to me, don't think that it's me. Anything that is good that's happening in my life is because of God. And then the last thing I want you to notice here is this. He knew his place. And he, this is what he means when he says, I've been sent before him. So John simply says, my purpose was to direct people to Jesus. This is my purpose. My purpose is not to have my names in, in light or johnthebaptist.com. I've just been sent to proclaim the name of Jesus. You know, as, as you, and I, I really want, I want us to think about this, all right? As you look at the disciples, you see that for all of them, they went out of their way to avoid drawing attention to themselves. Like they went out of their way to avoid even remotely drawing any attention to themselves. Does does John, as you read through the gospel according to John, does John mention his name? Not, Not even once. Read through 22 chapters. And what you'll notice is John doesn't even mention his own name. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Pride is the greatest enemy of the servant of God, and it has reduced so many ministries to dust. Pride is the greatest enemy of the servant of God, and it has reduced so many ministries to dust. Every single sin in our life, You read Mere Christianity, and this was one of the points C.S. Lewis made. Every single sin in our life can be traced back to pride. Every single sin. Lust, drunkenness, covetousness, greed, envy. Uh, Go through the list, Galatians chapter 5. Every single one of those sins can be traced back to pride. Disobedience is rebellion. Disobedience is rebellion. When we choose to sin... We are choosing to trust in ourselves and please ourselves and to rebel against God. And at the very heart of that is a heart of pride. And let me tell you something that is like a single cancer cell. When you and I accommodate that in our life, it begins to metastasize and multiply and ultimately it will lead to spiritual disconnection from God and even for us losing our ministries. And so John simply said this message, I came with one purpose, and that was to point the way to Jesus. Verse 29, second thing I want you to notice here, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. You guys may want to highlight or underline verse 30. The second thing about John the Baptist that I love is that he enjoyed seeing Christ exalted. Total joy. And this is the illustration he uses, okay? He uses a a very familiar illustration. They loved weddings, wedding ceremonies. In the wedding ceremony, uh, the, the guests would sing a song to the bride, 
But the purpose of singing the song to the bride was to exalt the bridegroom or the groom. And so while they were singing to her, it was exalting the, the bridegroom or the groom, and then the friend or the best man would be rejoicing that all of this attention is being directed to his man, the groom. And this is what John the Baptist is saying. He says, I am like the best man, and as these songs are being sung, I rejoice that Jesus, the groom, is the one who is being exalted. In fact, he says, I must decrease and he must increase. I'll flip that around. He must increase and I must decrease. This was his mission in life, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. I was talking to a, a very well-known pastor. If I mentioned his name, you guys would know who um, he is. And we were having a conversation, and he was talking about uh, praying in the name of Jesus. And we were talking about what that means, and he said, you know, one thing that I think it means is that we are praying so that in the name of Jesus means um, that he gets all of the glory. That really when it's all said and done, this is the desire of our heart. It's not like 10, 4, over and out, good buddy, in Jesus' name. It is... Lord, we pray our desire in praying in your name, our heart is that you get the glory for absolutely everything. And he said, you know, I've been praying for the churches in my area. He said, because I'm such a, a well-known pastor, he said, it may be that God is going to get the most glory by moving in somebody else's ministry, by moving in somebody's home fellowship. You know, there's such a notoriety that's connected to my name, he said, that I've just started praying, God, maybe what you want to do is pour your Holy Spirit out on that church or on that home fellowship because that's where when you do a work, you're going to get the most glory. And I thought, man, how many of us would selflessly pray something like that? How many of us are so interested in the glory of God that we would be honest enough to say, you know what, God, maybe it's not through my life. Maybe the great work that you want to do needs to happen in his life or in her life. So God, because you, your glory is the chief thing that I desire, God, I pray that you'd bless him. I pray you'd bless her. I pray you'd bless that worship leader. I pray you'd bless that home fellowship. I pray, God, that you bless that men's study group. Bless my brothers and God, pour out your glory in such a unique way. It sifts through the motivations of our heart. And this is something I think that we all need to be able to say, um, he must increase, notice what he says here, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, um, he doesn't say we must increase together. You know, as Jesus, as you go up, take me up too. As your name gets big, I want my name to get big as well. So it's not like this mutual increasing that he's saying. He's not saying, Jesus, you need to be exalted, and I'm just going to kind of stay the same. I'm going to kind of stay in the same place. You know, it's not a, a static relationship. He says, Jesus, you need to be exalted, and I actually have to decrease. My intention, intentionally speaking now, I want you to be glorified and lifted up, and I want to go lower and lower and lower. When you are doing things for the Lord, I want to encourage you to be as inconspicuous as possible in your service. As you are serving God, and it's so easy sometimes to toot our own horn, someone comes along, they're like, man, you're so amazing. No, bro, it's, it's the Lord. <laughs> He's the one who's amazing. And this sacrifice, getting up at four every morning and praying to God, is just what every Christian does. It's the Lord, it's not me. And we've got ways of drawing attention to ourselves. But we need to learn to be inconspicuous. Jesus said when you're giving, make sure that your left hand does not know what your right hand is doing. So think that through. Be incon as inconspicuous as possible. But then remember as well, John the Baptist, he had a public ministry. Even though he had a public ministry, he made sure everyone knew that it was God who was doing the work. He made sure that everyone knew that God was the one who was getting the glory. Verse 31 says this, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. 
He who has received his testimony is certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And then finally, verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, there's controversy over verses 31 to 36, and this is the controversy. Who wrote this? Some people say this is a continuation, that John the Baptist wrote these verses. Some people say that there's actually a break here, and John, the author of the gospel, these are actually his words. And so you say, well, I'm just going to figure it out by looking at the quotations. But the problem is, in the original language, there are no qu quotations. So you're kind of left to context to determine who wrote this. It may be that, you know, John the apostle is building off of verse 30 when he's talking about, um, when John the Baptist is talking about Jesus Christ increasing when he's talking about the supremacy of Jesus, John kind of breaks in and brings some qualifications to that. On the other hand, it may be that John the Baptist is doing the same thing. Um, honestly, if you want my opinion, uh, I have no idea, all right? And my opinion really is this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's John the Baptist, it doesn't matter if it's John the Apostle, the fact is it's communicating the same thing. It's truth, and, and this is what's being conveyed. It's the supremacy of Jesus. Supremacy in his origin. So his message had authority because Jesus came from heaven and brought heaven's message to us, us, to us, to all of us here <laughs> on planet Earth. His message had authority because it came from heaven. And so the author's just simply saying this, we're from earth, our message is earthly, nothing original really comes from here his message has authority because he was there. So let me ask you something. Who else eternally existed with the Father from before time? Name one other person, okay? This is your Jeopardy moment. Someone sing the song. You guys are so fun. I love you Wednesday nighters. Who else existed for all of eternity with the Father from before time? Name one other human being. Yeah, there is no other, there is no other human being. So who really has the authority to convey the message of God? Listen, don't feel bad about the exclusivity of that message. I think a lot of us as Christians, we're like, well, you know what? We don't want to sound too exclusive. Why not? Because the Bible is exclusive. So he has supremacy because of his origin. He has supremacy because of favor and authority. I want you to notice real quick, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So there's a, a unique love that the Father has for the Son. Remember, when Jesus was being baptized, um, the Father spoke from heaven as the Spirit was descending as a dove. The Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember on the Mount Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John hang in there, Jesus with Moses and Elijah on right and left, and then God the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Sounds better in the King James Version, hear ye him. So there's a unique love that the Father has for the Son, but there's also a unique authority. This verse says that everything has been placed, the, the Father has placed everything into the hands of the Son. So Jesus is supreme because of his origin. He is supreme because of his favor and authority. And then the final thing I, I want to mention is he is supreme because he brings salvation. Verse 36, you may want to highlight this. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He who believes in the Son is everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is the message. He alone is the source of everlasting life. And for you and for me to escape the wrath of God, the only way to escape God's wrath is to put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. So what does the world need? Why does this message matter? This is your message. You know, here we are living in some of the craziest times ever. I would say to you what was told to Esther, God has raised us up for such a time as this. God has anointed us. You might be thinking, God, why couldn't I have been, you know, 
alive in the early 20th century? Why couldn't I have been hanging out with the hippies in the 60s and the 70s? <laughs> what was that? Tell me, what'd you say? Oh, you were. Well, bro, you got your bell bottoms? Good. Patchouli party later on. God has raised us up for such a time as this. Here we are. Let's not complain about it. Let's say, God, you know, you've given me the message. This is our message. That verse, verse 36, Jesus is the source. He is the path to everlasting life. And if we want to escape the wrath of God, it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this week, tomorrow we've got a message to convey to our guests. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the answer. Racial division economy in the dumps, issues with our government, Middle East about to blow up, geopolitical craziness, craziness with Iran and Russia and China. This is our message, not our opinion. Well, let me tell you what I think about those things. You know what? I don't care what you think. <laughs> what we care about and what the world needs is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's convey it. Let's convey it with love. And let's believe that as we bring it, God is going to touch people's hearts. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, God, that you love us. And what an amazing message. We have so many blessings to count in our life. And we want to thank you tonight. Father God, we want to thank you for your sovereignty, that you, God, are in control, that you're sitting on your throne. God, we want to thank you tonight. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, that we're, we're your children, we're forgiven, we're heaven bound. God, you've filled us with your Holy Spirit, you've given us your word, you've blessed us with the body of Christ. You've promised to never leave us or forsake us. We're able to cast all of our cares into you because you care for us. God, you've given us a future and a hope. You'll never fail. You'll always be faithful. You've filled us with your love and your grace and your mercy, your tender kindnesses. God, thank you. Thank you for your tender kindnesses. Thank you, God, that you're long-suffering with us. God, you've distributed spiritual gifts and you've given all of us a calling on our life. You've placed us in spheres of influence not to hide, not to be concealing our faith, but God, to be lights in this world, to be the salt of the earth. You've given us the opportunity to be ambassadors, to have the word of reconciliation upon our lips and to bring the most amazing message, the message that has true power. God, what a privilege just to name a few of the things that you've given to us, husbands and wives and kids. You've provided for our needs. You've blessed us to live in a country that has unparalleled freedoms in a standard of living, God, that is unmatched. I pray, Lord God, please help us to be thankful. Help us, Father, to lift up a, a song of praise to you. Help us, God, to be humble. We know your word says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And so, God, we want to decrease. We want to decrease and we want Jesus and his mighty name to increase in our lives. God, we want to be inconspicuous in our service. We want to direct people to him and not to ourselves. We want to have a heart to pray that you'd bring your glory through the lives of our brothers and sisters. God, even if it means that it costs us. Even if it means that they excel beyond us. I pray that we would hold your glory so high that none of that would matter, God. That We'd just be able to sort the self out of our lives. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as we're in an attitude of prayer, 
This evening, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe tonight you come, have come in and there's anxiety and conflict within your life. And what you see in the outside world is an inward reality for you. And you're searching. You're searching for peace. You're searching for purpose. You're searching for meaning for your life. You're looking for something that can lift you up and out of the circumstances and the chaos and the dysfunction. And I want to tell you tonight, it's, it's not a church leader. It's not a denomination. It's not the church itself. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one. He is the one. He is the Prince of Peace. And he is the solution to every issue in your life. He is the living God. He died on a cross for your sins in your place as a substitute for you. He loved you that much. For all of your offenses that you've committed against God and all of us have committed offenses against him. And we deserve his justice for all of the offenses you've committed. He hung in your place and took the punishment you deserve. And he was a perfect sacrifice. And God raised him from the dead on the third day. And this is the promise of God to you. This is the message of heaven. That if you believe in the Son, you can have everlasting life. You can have eternal peace. You can be right with God. Peace in your life begins with being right with God. And this is the testimony that Jesus Christ brought from heaven. He brought God's way. It's not through religions and philosophies. It's through the Son. Narrow is the gate that leads to everlasting life. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. Which will you choose tonight? Tonight, if you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, tonight God is calling you to himself. God loves you. God is extending to you an invitation for you to come just as you are. For you to lay down your objections, to lay down your doubt, to lay down the sin that has been interfering in your relationship with Him, and to believe in the gospel once and for all. And let me tell you something, you will never regret that. God will change your life. He will bless your life. He will give you the promise, the assurance of everlasting life. Tonight, if this is you, you need Jesus Christ in your life tonight. I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. I want to pray that God would give you the strength to take this step of faith and make this decision. And so, right where you're sitting tonight, if this is you, if you'd say, Derek, that's me, I, I need Jesus. I want him in my life tonight. I want the forgiveness of sins. I need his peace. I want to be right with God. I want you to just simply raise your hand tonight. I want to pray for you this evening. And so, if this is you, you need to take this step of faith. Just stretch your hand up high. God bless you over here on my right. I see your hand, and I see your hand over here as well. God bless you. That's awesome. Anybody else, I want you just to raise your hand tonight as God has spoken to you. This invitation is for you tonight. You need to come. God bless you. It's awesome. I see your hand as well. God loves you so much. He's doing something powerful in your life. God has spoken to you tonight. Don't object. Don't harden your heart. You need to come to him. If there's anybody else, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to see who you are this evening. God bless you. It's awesome. Tonight, if you're a believer in this place and you know that you've not been walking with God and you need to renew you need to rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been prodigal. You've, you've been in the things of this world. And, and you know God has spoken to you tonight. You need to come back. And you know that pride is leading to destruction. And I'm telling you, the next step, if you do not turn your heart back, the next step is the fall. And so tonight, as God has spoken to you, humble your heart. Turn your heart to him. I want to pray for you tonight if this is you. The devil's going to be lying to you. As I just said all that, the devil's going to lie to you, and he's going to say, you know, God doesn't want you back. After all you've done, please 
God doesn't want you back. I'm telling you, that's not the heart of God for you. He wants you back. He's been waiting for you to turn your heart back to Him. And, and if this is you tonight, I want to pray for you too. Would you raise your hand? God has spoken to your heart. You know you need to renew your relationship with God. You need to rededicate your life to Jesus. If this is you, I just want you to slip your hand up tonight and God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. Father, we love you, God, so much. Very thankful tonight as you've touched our hearts, God. We pray now for these hearts. Give them the strength and courage to take this step of faith and to receive all that you have for them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the chapel tonight. This is the most important part of our service as people are making decisions for eternity. For those of you tonight who have raised your hands, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. This prayer is a prayer of repentance. The word repent, as I've talked about, means to acknowledge to God that you've sinned against him. And to turn away from that sin is a, it's a prayer of trust and faith. You're going to be confessing trust and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acknowledging that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again on the third day. And that you're yielding your life to him, allowing him to be the Lord of your life. As you make this your prayer to God, God has promised to hear you. Man, he's going to do amazing things in your life. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. He said to Matthew, when Matthew was collecting his taxes, he said, Matthew, come and follow me. And the Bible says that Matthew left that tax collecting table. He got up and he publicly identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, for all of you who have raised your hands, I'm going to call you publicly as well. This is not to embarrass you tonight. It's to give you the privilege of identifying yourself publicly with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a privilege, and it's an important step of faith for you to take. Melania is going to lead us in a song of worship, and for all of you who have raised your hands, I want to lead you in this prayer. I'm going to ask all of you just to stand up, come on forward to the front tonight, so I can lead you in this prayer. If you raise your hands right now, don't even wait. Just stand up right now, come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in this prayer. A refuge for the poor. A shelter from a storm This is our God He will wipe away your tears Return your wasted years This is our God To curve upon His name He is mighty to say This is our God if there's anybody else tonight, God has spoken to your heart. He's doing something in your life. You do not want to stay in that seat. You want to respond by faith to what God has spoken to you, and you want to receive everything that he has. Listen, don't let anything keep you in that seat tonight. Don't let any lie that the devil is communicating to you, any fear tonight, don't let any of that hold you back. Tonight, you want all that God has for you. And so if God has spoken to your heart, listen, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know God is tugging on your heart tonight. You need to stand. God bless you. It's awesome. in prayer tonight. This prayer, it's not to me, it's not to this church, it's to God through his son Jesus. He has promised to hear this prayer tonight. He is going to bless your life as you make this your prayer to him. So let's bow our heads together tonight and I'd like you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. Tonight I confess I've sinned against you. God, I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe that he died for me, that he rose on the third day. 
that through faith in him, God, you have forgiven me. You've made me your child. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to live for you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. It's awesome. Uh, may God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow at Blessed Fest. In Jesus' name, amen.